Welcome to This Birding Life, a podcast for bird watchers everywhere. I'm your host, Bill Thompson III. This Birding Life comes to you from Bird Watchers Digest, where we've been publishing great content for bird watchers since 1978. Sample what we have to offer at birdwatchersdigest.com. And remember, Bird Watchers Digest is more than just a magazine. Stay tuned, and at the end of this podcast, uh, there's a special subscription offer. Now we'd like to thank our sponsors, Carl Zeiss Sports Optics, makers of the amazing Victory SF binocular and the stunning Harpia spotting scope. You can join the Zeiss community of birders at facebook.com slash Zeiss Birding. Red Start Birding offers optics gear and expertise to birders and nature lovers, plus unbeatable customer service. Give Red Start a try at redstartbirding.com. Finally, the American Birding Expo is your opportunity to experience the world of birding in one place. This September 21 to 23, 2018, in Oaks, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. More than 130 exhibitors from all over the world will be there. Learn more at birdingexpo.com. This is episode 83. Tom Stevenson and Bird Genie. I've always been fascinated by how technology and birding intersect, but there's one person who can claim a longer fascination and deeper understanding of these two seemingly disconnected topics, and that's Tom Stevenson. Tom Stevenson has been birding since he was a kid under the tutelage of Dr. Arthur Allen of Cornell University. He's written many articles, and his material and photographs have appeared in a variety of places, including Birding Magazine, Bird Watchers Digest, and several books. He's lectured and guided many groups in the U.S. as well as in Asia, where he trained guides for the government of Bhutan. He was on Zeiss's digiscoping team for the World Series of Birding, and in 2011, his team won the World Series Cape Island Cup. He also holds the U.S. record for a photo big day with his team capturing 208 species on camera in a 24-hour period. He's also a musician, and as a musician, he's played concerts and done studio work for many, many years, working with several Grammy and Academy Award-winning uh, artists, as well as performing with members of the New York Philharmonic and the Philadelphia Orchestra. His sound clients included the Grateful Dead, Phil Collins, and the FBI. He joined the Roland Corporation in 1991, and managed the recorder division and retired as director of technology. Tom burst onto the birding scene with his book that he co-wrote with Scott Whittle, The Warbler Guide, published by Princeton University in 2013. It won the National Outdoor Book Award, and the app for the book was also amazingly well received by birders. His new app, Bird Genie, is a Shazam for birdsong. It's been available since 2015, but recently had a new edition released. And that's what Tom is here to talk with us about today. Here's my interview with Tom Stevenson. Tom, uh, uh, tell us your affiliation. What, what is it that you do? So right now I spend most of my time either working on some projects for Princeton University Press, books and apps and so on, or doing a little bit of birding or just hanging out at museums and going to concerts. Yeah, going to concerts. Because, you know, early, an earlier aspect of your career was music. Yes, I was sort of accidentally became a musician, and I toured for about 12 years and um, did a lot of studio work and had, had a lot of fun in that uh, environment. And when I was 42, I got a real job, which turned out to be a lot of fun also, fortunately. And, uh, and who was I that with? That was with uh, Roland Corporation, okay. so I designed um, a lot of the digital multi-channel recorders and digital mixers and worked on various other projects for Roland, which was a lot of fun, too. And I, I retired um, as a director of technology for one of the divisions um, several years ago, and then I wrote the Warbler Guide, and it's all been down or Downhill. Up hill. <laughs> it's down, how you look at it, but... Well, the Warbler Guide kind of revolutionized warbler identification. You guys took not just, I would say, a, a unique approach, but sort of a holistic approach, sound, shape. You know, the, you, you guys innovated with the app, the identification app that you brought out accompanying the book where you could spin the bird around from every angle. And 
could, could you share a little bit about how that came about? Sure, um, and thanks for the your kind words about that. Um, basically, the warbler guide was the field guide I wish that I had had when I was learning birds for Bhutan or Ecuador or whatever. And the, the pieces that I found missing in prior field guides were, first of all, the comparison species. So you look at a bird and you say, I think I understand its ID points, and then you're scratching your head and going, well, I wonder what looks like that. Right. So you're folding the pages down and bending them and ruining the book, trying to find all these other similar species. So um, the first thing I did was try to put all those together so you could have a confident ID knowing you've compared it to everything that might be similar. Right. On the vocalization side, I had um, done quite a bit of birding outside the U.S. where I was going to new areas, and I had to learn new vocalizations. And I was struggling with how to do that. And I, and I read a lot of books on memory theory, and we do some, I do some workshops on that now. But um, the thing that really turned the corner for me, I think, was I was guiding a small group in Arizona. And I decided I needed to learn the thrasher vocalizations. I had been there a couple times, but I hadn't really focused on the thrasher vocalizations that much. And in doing so, I started using sonograms and I started to look at the structural differences between the species because you can't really learn those songs. Um, they're mimics and they vary their song constantly. But I found that one species, for example, would have a chip, like a fast, short note, embedded with slurs. And another species would do slurs and, but have isolated chips. And another species had a different kind of gap between the phrases and so on. And that was sort of a hook for me, and I, I wrote an article for Birding Magazine about that. And so then when I started working with the warblers, I started listening to every single warbler song I, I could find. And I filled out spreadsheets. How many sections? And I started to develop this vocabulary. How many sections? What's the structure of this song? How many elements? How many phrases? And so on. And it sort of led me down the path of trying to look at vocalizations from an objective means rather than the transliterations that you find in right. field guides, right. which I find to be pretty much useless in general. Um, we give a talk where we show 22 examples of vocals <laughs> and transliterations and to have people try to guess how many species they are. And right. it's, it's one, one species. species. <laughs> they're all totally different and useless. Um, but the, so the, having that objective language was another thing that I really had focused on for quite a while. I used to draw before I could make sonograms, I used to draw the sign, you know, right. sort of draw out little pictures and try to put them in the same part of a little notebook I'd staple together right. when I was going somewhere. Put, putting a visual representation to the to the sound. Yes, yeah, giving our my mind a, a, a second way of entering that sort of identification and knowledge process right. with it. Right. Nice. Um, yeah. And now, uh, coming soon, I guess is something even farther out into that same space. Yes, yeah, so... Um, uh, you keep pushing the band. You're like <laughs> Gene Roddenberry and yeah. this, all the Star Wars. Yes, I think I might end up out in space, too, locked in a capsule. But um, <laughs> uh, Yeah, so um, I started to sort of think about how you would take this formal analysis and apply that using music technology or using an analytic technology. And um, so I, I found a company in Cambridge that I knew some people who worked at Isotope. You may know those guys. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't Cambridge Analytica. Uh, not Cambridge Analytica. Okay. Different Cambridge. Too. Yeah. But um, uh, so I could sort of think about, well, how do we analyze what the structure is of this song? What are the, what are the formal limits of the frequencies for that song? How fast, how much space is there between elements and that sort of thing? And I actually wrote a patent, which was, uh, which was accepted, and I, and I have a patent on that process of identi identifying animal vocalizations using all these structural char characteristics. And um, long story short, um, I ended up working with a programmer and with Princeton University on a program that's designed to help you identify birds by recording the song on your iPhone and then uh, identifying it for you, giving you the, mm -hmm. the highest probability of, of what those songs might be. Um, and that uses probably 150 different criteria mm -hmm. um, uh, based on the structural analysis and various other things that uh, 
that I was looking at in the Warbler Guide. So 100, and beyond. 150 different criteria per song. Yes, right. So, so this sort of a general mapping of the audio happens so, first. It's like this call right here. Yeah. So that call, we would look at that call. First, you have to isolate it from the background. So you say, all right, what is the volume of the maximum and right. minimum of that below some floor that you find? Mm -hmm. And we apply some a little bit of noise reduction as well. Okay. And then we look at, all right, what's the pitch curve of that? It curves goes up or down or, you know, and, and what's the harmonic structure? So a sine wave has, um, a pure sine wave has maybe one fundamental that's, that's double the frequency of the sound itself and another one that's double that and so on. Um, but birds, because they have very complex uh, syrinxes that they use to make their vocalizations, can do all kinds of crazy things with harmonics. For example, a red-breasted nuthatch has a song that has elements that have multiple harmonics that are non-integral series from the, from the fundamental, and the loudest one is not even the lowest one, which is, would be if you pluck a string or a violin or anything, right. the lowest harmonic is always the strongest. So right. birds do crazy stuff. But that's great because that's a signature for that particular um, species. Right. So we can look at that and go, all right, here's a species where the harmonic structure is six to eight harmonics within this sort of range of analysis that we can say, well, the, the, the ratio between the harmonics may be 0.3 or something mm -hmm. like that. And then the third one is usually the loudest or the second one and so on and so forth. Um, and we apply all those analytic um, bits that we get from looking at a, a lot of different um, examples of that vocalization and then use probability and sort of what we call fuzzy logic to say mm -hmm. all right if it has some of this characteristic we'll weight it by a certain amount and then another characteristic we weight by another amount and that gives us a sort of a range of um, ID criteria for a particular species. Um, so did you ever read any Alvin Toffler? No. Future shock and you, <laughs> no, you, I have Because you seem like a futurist to me, like <laughs> Tom Tomorrow, you know, that's, that's what we should call you. Let me write that down. This is cool stuff, man. Uh, and do you, are you driven to do this? I mean, do you, you're so fat, you seem so fascinated really and engaged with it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I have never had a plan. <laughs> like, I got into the music business just because I got a recording contract with CBS when I was 18 because the guys I was playing with just got and I just sort of said oh, okay and right. <laughs> and that just led to various other things and when I was doing uh, studio work and I started doing studio work I just got really interested in synchronization yeah. I don't know why but simply time code I was like wow that's very interesting stuff and nobody was understanding it that well no. and so I got a lot of studio work based on that and then I started looking at compu early computers, and right. I'm like, this is going to be important. And sampling, I really got interested in sampling, because as a drummer, I knew the drums were going to be gone pretty soon, because they're easy to sample. <laughs> so, right. so I was looking at all that stuff. So it's really a job protection kind of thing. <laughs> well, in a way, self-preservation, <laughs> that's true. But um, it's all been sort of accidental in a way, but I've, I've allowed myself to sort of follow my instincts in terms of things that I was interested in that happened to coincide with what was becoming more yeah. popular or useful, I guess. You, well, you seem to always be inquiring about them. If something intrigues you and plucks at your fancy, and then you follow that, Yeah. follow the butterfly there. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's cool, though. Yeah, I mean, that's what makes me excited about life and yeah. everything. I mean, I, I feel that way about art and architecture. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of ways that bird-watching knowledge imitates all the other kind mm -hmm. of great knowledge that you right. can music is the same same thing too but. so this next thing you got what's it called uh, it's called bird genie okay and uh, it should be out soon uh, we've been saying that for a little while but I think this is really <laughs> gonna happen now right. but having a little issues with getting the Android program done and yeah. so on but um, yeah so we're hoping that bird genie first of all allows people who don't necessarily know bird songs really well to find out more about what the birds are around them. Mm -hmm. So they can go into their backyard and that bird they've heard singing, you know, for years, they can identify it, well, it's a house wren right. or it's a, per a house finch or whatever. Um, I, one of the, the things that drove me to do this program is I was visiting somebody on Long Island and it was an elderly woman and she had a very nice garden and lots of bird feeders. And she said, and I asked her, well, what birds do you have coming here? And she said, well, I have a cardinal and I have a woodpecker. I was like, yeah, is that it? I mean, and she said, yeah, I think that's about it. So I went out back, and in the space of about six minutes, 
I heard 12 different species. Right. So I came in and I showed her the species and she just got so excited. She's like, that bird is here? Oh my <laughs> God, that's fantastic. You know, there's just really great colorful birds. So I thought, well, you know, it would be great for someone like that to have that tool. Oh yeah. And this product is really designed for that application. Local parks, your backyard, right. <clears throat> people who feed birds. This version is not for people who are hardcore listers or, you know, right. big spring migration fanatics or whatever. Um, maybe that'll come later, we'll see. But um, for me, the most important thing is to open people up to m more awareness of, of the yeah. birds that are around them. Um, right. Also, bird song is not well known. It is really not well known. Uh, you would think that we know everything about it now. Right. We really don't. And so one of the problems is there are not that many examples of vocalizations of, say, song sparrow across the country. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, one researcher will go out and study all the birds in Indiana, you know, and then he writes his paper and gets his PhD, and then that's the end of that, and so on. So one of the things we're hoping with Bird Genie, if it gets widely adopted, is we can collect all that song data Mm -hmm. And we're having comments from the crow section. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we can collect all that, those data, and have that available for scientists, so they can now start to listen to song sparrow songs right. from all over the country and so on and so forth, which we hope will be useful as well. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Um, Bird Genie will be an app that can be downloaded from the app stores. Yeah. So iOS version from the App Store, and then the Google version from Google, Google Play, Play. I guess right. it is nice <clears throat> wood thrush calling over there now. <laughs> We've had a few other birds calling here. Yeah. Right? Oven bird and right. This um, is a nice, rich environment. I love this yeah. festival. Oh, it's great. Uh, so Bird Genie, you're gonna give birth to the Bird Genie, and it's gonna come out. And then, what do you think? Where, do you have any idea what's next? Yeah, I, I do actually. Okay. I have some <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to expand the species range that we're looking at and, you know, adding other types of species. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to add some more, um, I mean, we cover about 100 species in that program with about 200 vocalization types, but maybe expand that some. There is some 3D models and stuff. There's a kind of a catalog there. You can kind of use it to learn about birds, too. Um, but then maybe to... More, greater awareness of what's around your home. Mm -hmm. Like, what's singing? Is it a frog? Is it an insect? Is it, right. a, you know, whatever's out there? And we have some plans to integrate that with some other systems. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's, it should be interesting. I wonder if this won't be a plus for um, uh, the next generation of nature enthusiasts. Because, uh, you know, every spring I go and speak to a couple of different groups. I was just down in Kentucky and, the, you know, I was, I've been at a couple other things uh, in the last month or two where it's a lot of gray hair, oh, a lot of people mm -hmm. worrying over how are we going to get new birders, young birders, not just young, but also new birders, people mm -hmm. who, are, mm -hmm. who are sort of hitting that middle-aged uh, time of their lives where they've got money and time. And what do we do with it? Mm -hmm. Prime suspects, or prime, not suspects, prime candidates mm -hmm. for becoming interested could be in nature. Suspects too, you know, well, right. eventually, yeah. But I'm wondering if, if having, introducing technology in a non-invasive, mm. in a helpful, mm -hmm. uh, expansive way, not an invasive way, mm. not a replacement. Yeah. I wonder if that, do you have any hopes for that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And yeah, uh, I mean, I know we're losing a lot of people who used to play around in the leaves and so on when they were kids and just sort of got that nature in their blood. Mm -hmm now are doing other things, electronic you know, games and that sort of thing. When I was at Roland, we actually did some studies of why music sales in Japan were declining. Yeah. And it had to do with cell phones mm -hmm. and how people were using the cell phones and gaming at yeah. that time. So I think that's a really good point you're bringing up. Can we use that to help people become more aware of what's around them? And, th and that's certainly something we would like to do. Um, and usually when people do become aware of what's around them, they go, oh my gosh, look at that, you right. know, the, look at that scarlet tanager. Right. Or, and who knows when yeah. that spark's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And so the program is, will hopefully be one tool that could be used for yeah. that. That would be great. I want to go back to the music part. Uh, my dad was a musician and later in life became a birder after we started Birdwatcher's Digest. And I've been a birder all my life and became a musician in my teen years, you know. 
carried both of them forward. Dangerous years, those 10 years. Those 10 years, oh my gosh. That's, uh, yeah, turn and burn. But um, I wonder if you could talk about any affinity that you've seen between the ear of the musician and the ear of the birder, or the mm. creative mind of the musician and the sort of how that can be a fertile ground for to be a mm. nature enthusiast. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting issue. Um, a lot of times when I've given talks and so on, sometimes people will go, well, you were a musician and that's why it's easy for you or yeah. whatever. And I don't believe that at all. Um, I think what you gain from being a musician, well, first of all, I was a drummer. That's not really even a musician. You know what I mean? <laughs> so what, what you gain from being a musician is just the habit of listening closely. Right. So you're spending time going, no, that wasn't the right note, this is the right note, right. or um, you know, playing scales where you're listening carefully to what the notes are right. and so on and so forth. So I think in that case, um, the musician has that advantage of just having been focused on that pastime. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not something that you know, everyone could, can gain that focus. Right. If you've ever been focused on anything in your life, you can just easily apply that to, to hearing. Um, there are some interesting studies too that show that focusing on really short sounds, and in these studies they've used phonemes, but it would be like bird calls right. or even bird songs, um, staves off age-related hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's sort of a focusing that your brain can do on sound that really is beneficial to your, your mind and your hearing ability in general. Um, the other thing as a musician you might do is have a little bit more experience listening for structure, like overall mm -hmm. how sounds fit together. Um, but again, I think, especially in the birding world, that just hasn't been a presence for most people forever, really. Yeah. And that's that's what I hope the Warbler Guide book and so on will help you know, shine a light on. Here's a way to listen to something, even if you don't know it, where you could objectively describe it to someone else or to yourself when you go home and, and start to really hear more carefully. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like I'm going to go back to birding stuff. Um, if you know what a supercilium is and what a mallard stripe is and what primary projection is, you're going to see better. When you see a sparrow, it's not going to be, oh, there's a brown bird over there, that's a sparrow. You're going to go, hey, that's the sparrow with the big supercilium and, you know, the, the wing coverts right. with the buffy edges and so on and so forth. Because you have that vocabulary, you can, you can see better. Right. And the same thing is true for sound. If you have no voc vocabulary for it, you're not hearing I as well, in yeah. my opinion. And that's certainly true for transliteration. Transliteration really doesn't give you any of those tools. But if you start to listen carefully for those, uh, the vocabulary that you've developed for that structure and so on, you really do start hearing better. And yeah. that, to me, is kind of what, you, as a musician, you've kind of learned to do a little bit when you're saying, well, if I want to listen to a Mozart string quartet, I'm going to listen to the structure and that, or the pitch changes and the harmonic changes and so on. Um, that's the same thing you can do with birds, but you need that foundation of what do I listen for? Right. The same thing, what do I look for? Well, with shorebirds, you're going to, you know, you want to tell a white rump sandpiper from a semi-palmated sandpiper, you look for the primary projection and sort of overall things that you, that you can focus on with vocabulary that helps you find them. Right. That's good stuff, man. Well, I've, I've always enjoyed our brief encounters in the primarily in the spring here and up at McGee Marsh and stuff. It's always great to hang with you, Tom. And I could we could keep going on for another hour talking birds, music, technology. And I think it's really cool the stuff you're doing, and I want to congratulate you on it. Well, thanks. Yeah, I always enjoy uh, interacting with you too, Bill. Right. It's uh, always great. Good luck to you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Tom. My thanks to Tom Stevenson for speaking with us here at This Birding Life. You can check out his fantastic warbler guide at thewarblerguide.com, and you can try out his bird song recognition app at birdgenie.com. And now, a shout out to our sponsors. If you're not reading Birdwatcher's Digest, you're simply not living your fullest possible birding life. You can change this by visiting birdwatchersdigest-digital.com. And if you'd like to subscribe to Birdwatchers Digest, here's a special offer for listeners to This Birding Life. Simply go to birdwatchersdigest.com slash TBL and subscribe. You'll get a special $5 off deal. We hope you'll take advantage of it. 
Carl Zeiss Sports Optics makes top flight binoculars and scopes for birding. You can join the Zeiss community of bird watchers at facebook.com slash Zeiss birding. At Red Start Birding, we look forward to changing the way you see the natural world. Visit redstartbirding.com for the best in birding optics and gear. Finally, the American Birding Expo is the world of birding in one place. Join us this fall in Philadelphia and experience the birding lifestyle for yourself. Birdingexpo.com That's it for this episode, peeps. Subscribe to the RSS feed if you haven't already so you won't miss a single monthly episode. And you can send us comments to editor at birdwatchersdigest.com. That comes right to me. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you out there with the birds. This is BT3 saying, laters. Laters.